to you at home for joining us this hour. There's a city in Ukraine called Kharkiv. I don't know, I don't know exactly how you pronounce it. K-H-A-R-K-I-V. Kharkiv, Kharkiv. Uh, it's in eastern Ukraine. It's very close to the Russian border, as you can see there. And in March of this year, about 20,000 people had to be evacuated out of Kharkiv because an arms depot used by the Ukrainian army caught fire. That's what it looks like when your arms depot catches fire. I mean, fire's never good, but fire in a place storing thousands of tons of artillery shells, that's really not good. They moved 20,000 people out of the way for obvious reasons, and that thing kept exploding and kept burning for days. As it burned, it just kept blowing off artillery shells in every direction. That happened in March. When the fire stopped and people were able to get back into that town, they found pieces of missiles and artillery shells and tank rounds all over the town everywhere. The Ukrainian government said that fire in that arms depot did not start by accident. Um, that obviously is nearby where Russian troops and Russian-supported troops have been pushing at Ukraine's border and where the fighting has been. Ukrainian authorities say they think that artillery depot in Kharkiv in March it blew up because somebody flew a drone over that artillery depot and then dropped some sort of incendiary device into it, which set off the fire, which set all the rounds going. That's how that days-long set of explosions started. So that was in March. Then earlier this month, it happened again. This time in a city that is right on the front lines of that Russian land grab in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, in the Donetsk region. Again, this was an ammunition depot used by the Ukrainian army. Uh, Ukrainian authorities say that one also was arson. It was some sort of sabotage. Somebody set that artillery depot on fire. And now today it's happened again. And look at the footage that we've got from this one. This is from Reuters. Um, their camera, you'll see, is well back from the ammunition depot, right? And you can see these like individual spiraling, zigzagging flashes of light. Looks like they, you know, it's like screwed up tracer fire or drunk fruit flies or something. Or <laughs> drunk fireflies, rather. Uh, but you see them just sort of going off one by one. You can tell something's going on there. But then ultimately, you get what is just a massive, massive blast because this is a depot, there it goes, that reportedly holds about 20,000, 200,000 tons of ammunition. So rocket artillery, tank shells, missiles. This thing started going off last night. Various explosions went off all day long today, including some of these gigantic mushroom clouds that you saw. Ukrainian authorities say that this one, too, may have been started by sabotage. They say this may again have been a case where a drone was flown over this ammunition depot that then dropped something into it to set this thing off. About 30,000 people were evacuated out of the immediate area where this happened today in Ukraine. And, you know, it's unnerving, obviously, for Ukraine that this has now happened for a third time. It's, I'm sure, very upsetting for the Ukrainian army for them to be losing all their artillery and ammunition this way. But this one is particularly unnerving for Ukrainians because this happened really far from the fighting. This happened really far from anywhere near the front lines. I mean, just basic map of Ukraine here. Right? The, the fighting with Russians and Russian-supported troops is in the eastern part of Ukraine. Kiev, of course, is the capital city. Where this happened today is southwest of Kiev. So this is way out of the way. This is in the heartland of Ukraine. But the Ukrainian government is saying, saying today, essentially, that the Russians were able to get them, even there. Russia seized a big part of Ukraine. They seized Crimea in 2014. They've been fighting in other parts of eastern Ukraine ever since. Daily Beast has a good report today, a good reminder of how Russia fights uh, using information warfare alongside real-world tangible tactics like blowing up ammunition depots and invading and seizing neighboring territory. As, as Facebook is increasingly struggling to answer criticism in this country over how its platform was used in the Russian attack on our election last year and why the company hasn't been more helpful to investigators trying to get to the bottom of that attack and trying to figure out if Americans helped in that attack, Daily Beast reports today that Facebook has been in this battle space before, also involving the Russians. At the same time Russian troops were invading Ukraine to take Crimea in 2014, Russian information warfare operators were using a surprisingly effective technique on Facebook to clear Ukrainian voices off of social media. So the Russians wouldn't have any competition for the information space 
while it was invading that neighboring country. What these Russian operatives would do is they'd find Ukrainian activists, people arguing in favor of Ukraine in this conflict between Ukraine and Russia, and then they'd go to online Facebook posts by those people, and then they would click report on those posts. And whatever that person's argument was, whatever the picture was, whatever the thing was that person was sharing, these Russian operatives would swarm it and report it over and over again to Facebook as porn. Or they'd report it as you know, inappropriate nudity or, or some other thing that you can flag to Facebook as a reason that a post should be taken down. It's like kind of the online equivalent of swatting, right? Where you call in the SWAT team. Like the, you call the police about your neighbor, you say some terrible crime is being committed, even though nothing's really going on, and then the police respond and your neighbor has to deal with this you know, annoying and expensive and potentially dangerous police response. Right? So one thing if you do that as a nuisance, you do that as a, a one-off effort to harass somebody or to play a prank, but when you do it systematically as a state-sponsored tactic of warfare, you get good at it, <laughs> and you do it in bulk. And in the case of the Russia-Ukraine stuff back in 2014, 2015, it meant they were blowing the whistle to Facebook about these innocuous posts by Ukrainian activists. They were doing it hundreds of times, thousands of times for each post and for each activist, and it worked. It in fact became such a point of concern that the president of Ukraine raised the issue with Facebook, asked Facebook to please consider maybe creating an office in Ukraine so they could deal with this special problem they were having here with Russian operatives taking all these Ukrainian voices off of social media. Facebook laughed off that request from Ukraine and their president. But the Daily Beast today went back and interviewed some of the activists from Ukraine who were shut up by Facebook when all this was happening because Russian operatives targeted them to be shut up. I mean, around the time that Russian troops were literally invading Ukraine and taking over part of that country, Facebook was helping those Rus the, the, the Russian government shut down opposition voices from the country they were invading. One of those activists tells the Daily Beast today that what he posted online in one instance was, quote, a picture of my city with a picture of a rainbow over it, and the picture said, everything will be okay. That's what he posted. Russian operatives swarmed that and reported it over and over and over and over and over again as porn, and that activist was blocked from Facebook for a month while Russia invaded his country. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg uh, put out a new statement tonight expressing regret for having made dismissive comments about the power of online misinformation and potentially shaping the outcome of the presidential election last year. But the more we learn about what Russia did in our election last year, the clearer it becomes that Russian intelligence and the Russian military, they don't see Facebook and information warfare as some sort of sideshow, some sort of some sort of lark. It's not some experimental thing they're dabbling in for fun or, or, or to harass people. It's really central to their real war efforts and to their overall geopolitical strategy on this planet. I mean, as Russia was literally seizing territory from a neighboring country within the last few years, as they became one of the only modern industrialized nations in a generation to have invaded a neighboring country and taken over part of its territory, Russia also simultaneously took to the information space to shut down activists from that country. They've also been all over the globe promoting secession movements and breakaway independence movements in all sorts of countries. They've been, in other words, they've been looking to get bigger while they've been busy working to make sure that everybody else gets smaller. They're literally taking over neighboring countries' territory to make Russia a larger country while promoting in the online space movements that would break apart their rivals and competitors on the global stage. We saw that this week in Iraq where Russia was one of the only nations on earth that supported the Northern Iraq referendum in which the Kurds voted this week that they should break off Northern Iraq from the rest of Iraq and become their own independent nation. The United States government is radically opposed to that and has in fact been fighting more than a decade in Iraq to try to keep Iraq together as a single nation with a single government. Russia on the other hand is all for blowing it apart. So they supported that referendum as did, incidentally, Donald Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort, whose latest paying consulting job since being warned by prosecutors that he's about to be indicted, has been advising supporters of the Break Up Iraq referendum, which happened this week. 
There's also going to be another independence referendum this weekend in Spain where the Catalan region is voting on whether or not they'd like to break off and form an independent state apart from Spain. Turns out Russia's supporting that one too. What's the Russian interest in Catalonia? I don't know, but it is part of a theme. And we've talked about this on the show in the past a little bit. Russia for years in this country has actively promoted the secession of Texas. They've promoted the quirky Texas secessionist movement to the point of inviting Texas secessionists to Russia, it paying their way to come to meetings and conferences in Russia so the Russian government could help them promote the independent Republic of Texastan or whatever. In the immediate wake of President Trump's victory in last year's presidential election, you might remember a new flurry of enthusiasm and attention to the various efforts uh, that, uh, to, to have California secede from the United States. That was until one of the best funded, slickest California secession outfits last year turned out to have its headquarters in Russia. Literally, they, the, one of the California secessionist movements had a government funded free office in Moscow. And their leader, the leader of the movement, who was applying to get it you know, on the ballot in California and everything, was living in Siberia while running that movement. Russia also famously supported secession within the European Union. They were a major supporter of the UK Independence Party, which drove the, the UK to its Brexit vote to break, break the United Kingdom out of the EU. Russia was also a massive financial supporter of the National Front in France which among other things promised to break France out of the European Union along the same lines as the UK leaving in Brexit. Right, so on the, on, on the one hand, if you follow each of these things individually, it looks complicated. You see Russia involved in one way or another in all of these different countries' elections and all of the subtle internal politics of all these different places all over the world. Sometimes it's, they seem left-wing, sometimes they seem right-wing, sometimes they just seem strangely interested. But there they are in the UK and in France, and in Spain, and in the Middle East, and in the United States, and, and in all of these other disparate places. So it looks complicated on the one hand if you just follow those as individual stories, but on the other hand, just step back and it's as simple as it could possibly be. Russia is busy making itself as big as possible, including taking over parts of neighboring countries while it's simultaneously supporting movements all over the globe that make every other place in the world as little and as divided as possible. Right, we're getting big and stretching out. Why don't you guys fight amongst yourselves and split into a million pieces? Here, let we help. Right, I, I have reason to believe that Russia does not watch this TV show. So here's an experiment. Let's create a fake secessionist movement in the United States on the theory that Russia will support secession of anyone in the West for any reason, just because they'd really love for the West to break apart. The smaller the pieces, the better. Right? We know they've already supported Texas seceding and California seceding. And, you know, there is, at the kernel of those little movements, there is some legit organic interest in those places and maybe breaking off, even if it is kind of tongue-in-cheek. But Russia will take that. They'll, they'll build from that. They'll, they'll fund it. They'll give you free offices. They'll do whatever they can to hook you up. They'll staff it from Moscow. Let's make up a new one and see if we can get Russian support. First idea I had for this today is that we'd set up a movement called... No Ohio. <laughs> See if they bite on that. And then somebody else on the staff came up with, no, 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 we should be Tennessee, because maybe they'd like a southern one. We also entertained the idea of Indiana becoming out Deanna <laughs> or ill annoyed. We are out of here. We're so annoyed. We tried on a few different ideas. We've now come down to four finalists. And you can vote at mattoblog.com or on Twitter. Vote for which fake secession movement we should create online to see if it attracts Russian support. The choices are, ready? A, we will create a new independent republic of Manhattanistan in Manhattan. Or B, we will create a new independent region called Arizona. Option C lends itself, I think, to the best possible bumper sticker, kinetic cut, or uh, the one that might actually be familiar to them. They wouldn't even have to change too many of their online memes. Option D, New Mexit. Again, the theory here is that if you build it, they will come. Any little inkling of anybody wanting to break off any part of the United States, anybody wanting to break off 
any part of anything that exists in the West, from anything that constitutes the existing international order where Russia isn't a superpower, any centripetal force to blow things apart will attract Russian trolls like flies to Brexit. So, we will see. Kind of excited about this. Anyway, mattoblog.com. Alongside Russia's efforts to promote outright secession, though, as we learn more about what Russia did in our own election last year, particularly online and on Facebook, you can see the same concerted Russian effort underway. Not to literally break our country apart as a geopolitical unit, but to break our population apart to get the American people at each other's throats. CNN reports tonight that among the Facebook ads bought by Russian operatives last year during our presidential campaign were ads that not only referenced the Black Lives Matter movement, but specifically targeted Black Lives Matter related Russian advertising to audiences in Ferguson, Missouri and in Baltimore, Maryland. So they were taking places in the United States that were riven by anger and violence and conflict over the police treatment of African Americans. And <laughs> Into that, there came the Russians, trying to fuel that, trying to kindle that, trying to make the most of it that they could. And they knew enough about the subtleties of the issues here to geographically target those ads to the locations where they might do the most harm. Now the Daily Beast reports, in a fairly stunning story, that a Facebook group called United Muslims of America, uh, which went online during the election last year at facebook.com slash Muslim America, that organization actually took over the dormant name of a legit old organization in California that wasn't particularly active anymore. But that group that, that took the name that was operating on Facebook last year during the election really was run by Russian operatives. According to the Daily Beast, the site has been, quote, traced back to the Russian government. You remember last year leading up to the election when Donald Trump was insisting insisting even on close questioning that Hillary Clinton invented ISIS, that she created ISIS? Well, at least one of the online originators of that claim was this Russian government-operated Facebook page, United Muslims of America, which said Hillary Clinton created and funded and armed both Al-Qaeda and ISIS. The site also claimed that John McCain created ISIS. Needless to say, neither John McCain nor Hillary Clinton created ISIS. But the Russian government was impersonating U.S. Muslims on Facebook last year, claiming that that was true. And that was then happily echoed and insisted upon by the presidential candidate for the Republican Party. Politico.com now reports that Russian-funded Facebook ads also exploited, with some appreciable nuance, uh, division among voters on the left. At least one of the ads that Russian government operatives ran on Facebook last year said, quote, Choose peace and vote for Jill Stein. Trust me, it's not a wasted vote. Hashtag grow a spine, vote Jill Stein. Again, that was bought and paid for by the Russian government. Now that's not to say that Jill Stein wanted that from the Russian government, that she solicited it or knew about it, you know, but, but Russia wanted votes for her. And so alongside Russian paid Facebook ads promoting Donald Trump and criticizing Hillary Clinton, Russia was also running ads on Facebook promoting that you would not waste your vote if you voted for Jill Stein. Hashtag hint, yes you will. It'll be very interesting to see if we ever learn where exactly those ads were targeted. And if those ads ended up targeting would-be Democratic or liberal voters in some of the states where Jill Stein votes absolutely did outrun the vote margin between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Other Russian-funded political ads on Facebook, according to Politico.com, promoted votes for Bernie Sanders. And this was reportedly right before the presidential election, so long after Bernie Sanders had left the race and endorsed Clinton and said people should vote for her, Russian operatives were saying, no, 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 still vote for Bernie. That wouldn't be a wasted vote. So we're, we're starting to see clearly now how, how they operate, what they're trying to do, right? Russia supports division in the countries and in the geopolitical entities that they see as their rivals. Russia seeks to divide or silence when they can the political movements and political leaders that oppose them. Russia also seems to just like far-right populist movements that bring out the most anti-democratic and ugly tendencies in Western countries by turning native populations specifically against immigrants and refugees and minorities and Muslims. 
In Germany this weekend, Angela Merkel was re-elected to be the German Chancellor. But the other big news out of that election was that for the first time since the immediate post-World War II era, a far-right, anti-immigrant, anti-minority, nationalist party a la the UK Independence Party or the National Front in France will be represented in the German parliament. This, this far-right movement, it's called AFD, they got about 13% of the vote. They'll be represented in parliament and their interest in the election, we now know, were promoted by Russian state-run media and by Russian botnets. And interestingly, by Trump campaign veterans. A group called Harris Media, which was hired by the Trump campaign during the Paul Manafort era, group run out of Texas, they ran digital operations in Germany for this far-right, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant group that did surprisingly well in this weekend's German elections. Thanks, at least in small part, to an additional boost from Russia. So we're learning more every day now about what Russia did in our election. As we get more detail about that, it's becoming easier to see how investigators may be able to determine whether or not those Russian operatives working to influence our election had any American Confederates helping them do their work. Executives from Twitter are set to speak with the Senate Intelligence Committee tomorrow morning in Washington. Facebook has started, reportedly, to hand over information about what Russian operatives bought what ads targeting which people during our election. And as Facebook in particular gets dragged kicking and screaming into starting to disclose how well Russia used their platform, not just to silence their own dissidents anymore, not just to shut down, say, Ukrainian activists as they were invading Ukraine, but how they were used to manipulate and divide and misinform Americans toward a specific and illegal political end. The spookiest part of all of this is that Russia's action in that information space very clearly bled out into the real world. They did not just change what we saw, or in some cases what we thought and what we thought about. They didn't just presumably start fights and change votes. They also changed real lives in the real world in our country in sometimes violent ways. And one of the most unsettling incidents of that has just been reported out by the New York Times' Caitlin Dickerson, and she joins us next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.